Hi, I'm Jay Greenberg, also known as Jed, um, and I am the Executive Director of Good Shepherd Conservancy. Um, I'm also starting a standard bread heritage poultry uh, business operation uh, in uh, partnership with Frank on the East Coast right now, and I'm a student of Frank Gracie's. Um, I'm going to introduce Frank now, and um, and then uh, and then afterwards we'll talk about the Good Shepherd Conservancy a little bit, and uh, and go over a little bit of what we're going to do in this presentation in the session. So, Frank Reese is uh, my mentor and my friend. Um, he is a um, top breeder. He's he's recognized as the top breeder of standard bred turkeys and chickens in the United States um, and really worldwide. Um, he runs the country's only large scale commercial standard bread poultry operation. And you might notice that I use the word, the term standard bread, uh, not heritage. Um, we are trying to focus on standard bread because heritage is a marketing term that was developed by Livestock Conservancy. And it's really a, a marketing term that describes standard bread, but uh, it is not regulated well and um, and oftentimes is misused. And standard bread is a term which is a legal term, which uh, you can't just misuse it. So, uh, we're, so we generally just use the term standard bread, but if you, you know, are more aware of the term heritage, um, heritage is coming to describe a, a standard bread chicken or a chicken that comes from two standard bread parents. Um, so Frank run, runs the only um, commercial event, you know, large scale commercial standard poultry operation in the United States that's remaining. Um, he has been raising poultry his whole life. And uh, about 20 years ago, he started raising standard bread poultry commercially. Um, since that time, he's been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Vogue. He's been a number of books, The Dorito Effect, Big Chicken, Eating Animals. Um, some of the most notable ones. And, uh, and he was featured in the Eating Animals documentary um, a couple of years ago as well. Um, today, Frank Reese is the president of the Good Shepherd Conservancy where I'm executive director. And, uh, and he's really um, a top advocate for the use of responsible and um, ethical genetics within poultry and the livestock industry and, and, and advocates the use of standard bred heritage genetics in the commercial food market. Um, Frank, uh, would you like to say hi, maybe just say a word uh, before we move forward? Just say hi to everyone and thank you for being a part of this and beginning to learn about standard bread poultry. <laughs> Wonderful, thank, thanks Frank. Um, so just a little bit about Good Shepherd Conservancy, we'll talk about it more later, but uh, Good Shepherd Conservancy is a new nonprofit uh, founded in 2020 um, to, continue Frank's work and legacy and expand it. Um, what we're really working on is to uh, advocate for the use of standard bread poultry in commercial food production and to save standard bread poultry from extinction through use within commercial food production. Um, and um, and uh, we're doing that in a number of different ways, um, including training farmers and raising awareness with the general public. And we'll talk more about the work that we're doing within the Good Shepherd Conservancy a little bit later in the presentation. So um, the way this presentation, what we're gonna do is we have a PowerPoint that uh, I'm gonna screen share in a little bit and we're gonna share that with you. And through the PowerPoint, I'm gonna ask Frank questions. It's gonna be kind of an interview style and, and he's gonna be touching on the different parts of the, pyre, the PowerPoint and, um, and, uh, and I'll be leading things, but he's gonna be the main person talking. And the first part of the PowerPoint, we're gonna talk about poultry and we're gonna focus kind of on chickens, um, even though um, standard poultry really deals with chickens and turkeys primarily, but also deals with waterfowl. But we're gonna put a lot of focus on the chickens because they kind of tell the story of what happened. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, the domestication of chickens and then the, the, the start of standard bread poultry, where that came from, what that is, what that meant to the industry. And then we're gonna go on to talk about the industrialization of poultry and eventually the creation of the modern hybrid chicken and other hybrids. Um, but we're gonna focus again on the story of the chicken and the story of the meat hybrid, which oftentimes known as the Cornish cross and there's other versions like the Freedom Ranger and whatnot. 
And, um, and after we understand that, and we're really give you, what we're trying to do is really give you an understanding of what happened to poultry, what's the story, how did we get to where we are, what is these hybrids, what are they truly, what goes into making them, and then what we, why we feel so importantly about um, standard bred poultry and, and, um, and, and, uh, and what the Good Shepherd Conservancy is doing in order to help standard bred poultry succeed and reemerge within the commercial food industry. And then at the end, so and if you have questions, please save them to the end, you know, write them down or whatever it is, and we'll answer them at the end. There's a lot to cover. It's a very complex topic, um, standard bread and, and poultry hybridization. So we have a lot of ground to cover in, in the beginning. And uh, so please just save your questions for the end and we will, uh, we will get to answering those then. All right, so I'm gonna screen share here. Um, I'm gonna screen share uh, one second here going to just give me one moment here. Um, this tab, all right, and I can open up here. Okay, actually, one second here. So let me get to our presentation here. Should I have this up here? Just one moment. Okay, can everybody see the, uh, everybody can see the, uh, the PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay, good, very good. All right, all right, so, um, right, so let's, we're just gonna get started with the presentation here. Um, so, First thing is the origins of, of, of chickens and the domestication of chickens. Frank, can you, you know, just talk about the domestication of chickens, the red jungle fowl, and, and how uh, the breeds and varieties evolved over time? Yeah, the domestication of chickens, we know goes back at least 7,000 years. They have done the, the DNA study and so on, and uh, through the living birds that we have today, and all chickens are descendants of the various types of jungle fowl, the most common being the red jungle fowl. And I'm sure that those early domestications is, is uh, in the region of Asia and that part of the world, Indonesia, Java, China, and so on. They found young chicks in the wild and took them in. <clears throat> and in those early days of domestication of fowl, they were basically kept uh, for maybe egg production. Uh, some of the groups did begin to eat some of the chickens and so on, but they were quite small. And they did not breed for breeds at that time. Uh, this, uh, they were kept because it's whatever survived in that particular environment. And as those ch domesticated chickens began to spread throughout uh, Asia and Asia Minor were taken into Eastern Europe and so on. The birds began to evolve and change basically through selection and also through environmental issues. Uh, the chickens that survived in the humid areas of Asia and the islands were quite different than those breeds that survived. Some of the geneticists believe that some of the earlier breeds, especially those that were found in Tibet, uh, up into the uh, mountainous regions and the colder climates, <clears throat> that they feel maybe some of those ancestors, those birds are already extinct. But it was not really selecting for breeds at that time, it was se selecting for whatever survived and met the environment. Very nice. Um, so with that, um, most of the chickens, um, early chickens, you know, what would you, you know, what would you say they were? What, you know, what varieties, what breeds, what, what types of chickens were around? They were very similar, at least the ones that we know of were very similar to what you see in the picture here. They were small animals. Now, we don't truly know for sure some of the other breeds that we now call the Asiatic breeds the Cochins, the Brahmas, the Langshangs, um, 
that had feathers on their feet and were twice as big as the red jungle fowl, um, they know that they existed and that they were in these other parts of the world. They have done some of the DNA testing on those. And the only thing at this point in the latest study that just came out in the new book on genomes and genetics of poultry, um, the scientists have basically come up, they just feel some of these early varieties that led into some of these other examples have probably gone extinct. And that the evolution of, of going from this small legerin-like game bird type of jungle fowl into the very large Brahma, uh, they really don't know, but they know it, it happened. So their, their best results is that some of the ancestors of some of those other varieties in the wild had probably gone extinct. Right. Um, so next, um, in the United States, you know, um, fast forwarding a couple thousand years in the, you know, in the 1800s in the United States, can you describe what was going on with poultry um, coming in from all over the world? Yeah, this whole evolution of bringing poultry to the United States uh, began with some of the earliest um, migrants to, to America. Um, the British brought their poultry with them. And we know that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and many of the, the elite had poultry. Um, and that poultry then was kept basically at that time for egg production and that they would then maybe eat some of the surplus male birds usually out of those flocks. But it was considered in the 17th century, 16th, 17th and into the 18th century um, minor as far as real farm production. They were something that was added to the farm uh, for egg production. But at that stage too, they still really hadn't began to focus on improvement uh, of production. So some of the early birds that they brought to America uh, were the leghorns and the cornish and the minorcas, the dorkins. Those are basically Mediterranean English birds, the brahmas, which were, you know, the Brahmas came much later in about 1830, 1840, but that was a huge thing when the Brahmas were brought in there. But then there began to be some of the people basically on the East Coast in New York State and Massachusetts and Delaware and um, Pennsylvania who began to play with crossing some of these varieties of these breeds and starting to develop their own particular variety. And lots of various things had to come into place to make this happen. So that was the beginning of, and if you notice the names of many of these American breeds, Plymouth Rock, Wine Dog, Rhode Island White, New Hampshire, Rhode Island Red, or uh, have American names. And these were breeds and varieties of poultry that were developed here uniquely in America to meet our farming needs. But there was still at this period of time a lack of standardization of, of poultry and reliable meat and egg production. It was still down on the list of having importance in the economic effect that poultry made at that time. And then there was, at that same time, there began to be groups of, of people who were, were gathering together to share their genetics, to share what they were doing. Uh, and many of these names really were marketing things, but then they began to look at getting organized and developing the American Poultry Association. Um, the, the British Poultry Association is slightly older than ours here in America. Um, so, but that 
they got together to say, hey, we need to put more importance on meat production, more important, especially on dual production and egg production, and organize and improve uh, the quality of poultry. And, um, and, and Frank, so what effect when the APA was created and the standards of perfection, what effect did that have on poultry production in the United States? Well, as, as these well-renowned poultry breeders of the American Poultry Association began to organize and to say, you know, we, we need to build um, some type of a standard if you're going to call a chicken a, a Plymouth Rock, whether it be White Plymouth Rock or Bart Plymouth Rock or Silver Lace Wyandotte or Rhode Island Red or whatever, we need to have something that qualifies that. And also during this particular time, there began to be a real surgence amongst um, much of the United States and the Eastern half of county fairs, state fairs, expositions, and so on of agriculture, which would include horses and cattle and hogs and all this kind of stuff. And poultry became an important part of that, whether they were showing chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, guineas, pigeons, whatever. There was much written in the 1840s and 50s and 60s of these great expositions. And the American Poultry Association fathers, the early founders began to write standards and to say, if you're going to exhibit a Plymouth Rock, here's what it should look like. From the eye color to the beak color, to the shape of the body, to the type of the feathers, to the type of the toenails, and also its utility. In other words, how deep should the breast be? How much muscle should be on the chicken? And, and this became really important because they began to standardize. What that means, if you had barred Plymouth Rocks, in Massachusetts or in New York State or in Illinois or Indiana or Kansas, they were the same because they all fell under the same utilitarian purpose of that particular breed. And certain brigades began to stand out as truly being important in the economics of the development of poultry production in America. This all, the founding of the APA was in 1873. It is the oldest agricultural organization in America still in existence. Uh, the first standards official book approved by the American Poultry Association came out in 1874. So they were also training the next generation. They were also training judges and so on who could go out to the farms and help the individual farmers improve the quality and the marketability. Because in the cities then there began to be premiums for people who would show up with barred Plymouth Rocks or white Plymouth Rocks or quality white Leghorns or whatever into the city markets. And they began to have more and more value. So it began to grow very rapidly. And can you, can you just talk a little bit about the Plymouth Rock, the, the Bard, you know, the Bard Rock, Plymouth Rock and its place in the American poultry uh, market and, and, and what that did, you know, what, you know, what that chicken did with it within American poultry. Well, the, Mer the Bard Plymouth Rock was the first breed and, and variety of standard bred chickens to be brought into the American Poultry Association. Um, it literally changed the whole world. It became the standard for everything else. At one time, the Bard Plymouth Rock was raised by the millions and millions in this country. Yeah, it could be found in almost every state in the United States. Um, it became the premier chicken being sold in the major cities in the meat markets. It, 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 all the other varieties had their place, but they were often compared. And part of the reason is a little bit too is, is the Plymouth Rock was unique in that it seemed to be able to be moved and, uh, and taken to multiple environments, whether it be the cold north or the south and survive and produce 
It had excellent livability, wonderful immune system. Um, you were able to raise it on less efficient feed. Um, you know, it, it adjusted to its environment so well. So it became very, very popular. Very nice. Okay, so um, so what we can see here is that we you poultry emerged, and there was a lot of different breeds, and and uh, there was a lot of different varieties, and a lot of just birds that were just mixed together that were just raised on the barn, barnyard birds, called common fowl, and and over time certain varieties developed, and in the United States they saw a need here to standardize the varieties. And, and it really helped improve the meat market and improve the popularity of these breeds. And it helped make poultry more popular um, and more widespread and in certain breeds within that, like the Plymouth Rock became very popular within that and, and became known. Um, and, and, and so this is a bit about, you know, this is kind of the emergence of standard bread poultry. And standard bread poultry was really um, the, the, the heart of the poultry industry in the United States. And um, what I want to talk about next is the rise of industrial poultry. And um, Frank, could you, you know, talk a little bit about Cecile Steele and Delmarva and 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 how poultry started to become industrialized, and um, and, and that industry really started to grow in the city markets. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that that process? Okay, now we jump to the beginning of the 20th century. And, 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 you know, the American Poultry Association had already been in existence, you know, 25 or 30 years. And there was great strides happened from 1873 to 1900, improving the standardization, the quality of poultry in America. But also at that time, all the other components came into place that allowed her to, to be able to make this jump. Also, the industrialization of America radically changed as more and more people left the farm and moved into the cities. Uh, there became a greater need to produce food to feed the industrialization of the major cities. Um, Ms. Steele ordered 50, well, first, before I say that, they were basically uh, raising strawberries they were strawberry farmers and their crop that year failed and so she still wanted to be able to do something and feed her family so she ordered 50 chicks and instead of getting 50 chicks sent to her in the mail she got frank you're there and so to say, we found this rule for us today, but at that time, there were, you know, various other things had to come into place. And one of those was the ability to get better quality feed, also electricity, uh, or she may have used um, propane or uh, gas oil heaters, whatever, but she had to manage that many chicks in various buildings. And then uh, of course, she sold the birds live into the New York market. She did have that, at least that access to be able, and it was very successful for her. She was doing Bard Plymouth Rocks. Uh, that was the bird that was still the premier fryer type chicken. And it grew from there. Uh, her example uh, became very important in many other People began to do the same thing. The whole system radically changed. Prior to some of this, it was basically uh, you only had young chickens um, in, the, in the summertime. You know, you were completely dependent upon the, the to because there was no artificial means of poultry production at this time. But the invention of refrigeration and the inventions of uh, incubators and so on radically changed this and people were able to hatch chickens and keep them alive. The other important part that began to happen in the 19th century, I mean the early 20th century, was a better understanding of poultry nutrition, um, the better understanding of feed. Um, many of the people in the earlier years, chickens were basically fed table scraps. 
um, or maybe, you know, even when I was a kid, you know, you could shell some corn and you would throw that out. Now, that's one thing about old standard bread poultry. They can't exist without these high powered feed. But this was the beginning of, of more and more people having control over what the chickens ate and their, and their nutritional needs. Right. Um, so, uh, Frank, maybe you might want to shut off your video to uh, help your audio come in a little clearer because you've been having some issues there. Um, you know how to do that? Shut off my video? Yeah, shut off your video. Anyways, you're not you're not on screen right now, and it'll just help because we've been having some okay. audio. Issues. I shut it off. Okay, good. Um, great. So, um, right. So as we can see here, now we've got poultry starting to scale up and using industrial, the industrial revolution has helped us have more poultry raised at a time and lower the price a little bit. And then also um, the cities, as the cities are growing, there's these big markets of people that aren't really raising the birds in the, you know, on their farm, just raising a little bit here for their family. And they're wanting to buy the poultry from the farm. And this really caused the broiler industry to start growing, but it was still all based on standard bread poultry. And, and we can see from this earlier model that standard bread poultry was really able to feed America. And now a lot of times people now today are saying, oh, you know, I can't really feed, feed us. And, but standard bread poultry was a proven, already a proven model before, um, be, you know, even when industrializa industrialization was starting. Um, so Frank, uh, I think next, you know, this continued for a while and, and, and the next big uh, break in the industry, a big turning point was the Chicken of Tomorrow contest. And so Frank, can you talk about the Chicken of Tomorrow contest, what it was and, and how it introduced um, the rise of the hybrids in, into the American uh, poultry market? Yeah, the chicken of the tomorrow contest is post World War II, 1948. And this was also the beginning of, of moving the power source of what we raised and how we raised it and how we bred and produced it from the farmer who had controlled this for thousands of years and then now moved to basically land grant universities. And so, which is an important part because also then some of the organizations like the, the Poultry Board and the USDA and the Department of Agriculture uh, began to have more and more power. At the same time, post-World War II, there began to be a bigger movement amongst the um, food industry, especially the grocery uh, Headquarter, the grocery lobbyists in Washington uh, met with the USDA and the, agri the agriculture department and said, we need to improve the quality and the reliability of poultry in America. Uh, you know, they, they wanted everything to look the same as it came down the assembly line. So they reached out to basically what at that time uh, would have been some of the major hatcheries in America, everywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast. They reached out to these various hatcheries and said, uh, we want you to enter into this contest and we're going to be judging these chickens on rate of growth and immunity and health and breast development and feed conversion and everything. So all these companies across the United States at that time shipped uh, eggs by rail or sometimes they flew them in by airplane or whatever to the headquarters in uh, the USDA headquarters on the East Coast. Um, and all the chickens were hatched and, and raised and they kept all the numbers and the feed and everything. And the two breeds that won uh, were standard bred crosses, um, either a New Ham cross with a Cornish or a Plymouth Rock, white Plymouth Rock cross with a Cornish. But it began the whole thing of F1 crosses. The parents were pure standard bred, but now for the first time they found you get this hybrid vigor. 
This was also the big movement amongst the poultry industry who really began to say, hybrid is the new in thing. Hybridization is, is our future. And so uh, these two varieties then that won this contest and began to say, we can now provide this much more of a monoculture, uh, the same chicken for everybody in America. And so this is what happened as the results of this. And this began to focus then on certain companies that became more and more powerful in America and began to push out all the smaller mom and pop hatcheries. Right. And uh, the winners, um, the winners of the of the contest, which was Vantress, is now called Cobb Vantress and is owned by Tyson and Arbor Acres became Ross and is now owned by a multinational brand called Aviagen. Uh, they today are the, they own all the genetics for every Cornish cross hybrid that's sold and as well as any Freedom Ranger hybrid or any of the other, you know, slower growing quote unquote hybrids out there is owned by these two companies and they provide and they, you know, they, they sell those genetics to the, to the hatcheries and they, but the hatchery have to keep going back to them for more of those genetics. And so they, what we can see is that this contest had a huge impact on the American poultry industry. And uh, so Frank, at first the, the, they were working with F1 hybrids and then they got into like F2, F3, right? They got, they got into more um, crossing a hybrid with a hybrid, right? I mean, that's, that was the next step within this. Well, it was brilliant what they did. You know, they wanted to become the only source of meat chickens in America. They attempted to try to patent this. And of course, the patent office wouldn't allow them to do it because at that point, um, you couldn't patent a living, or, a living organism. So to get around the control, um, hybridization was a brilliant way of controlling the seed stock for poultry. Uh, because if you were a grower for one of these organizations and they sent you 10,000 little chicks to raise for meat, you could not keep them and reproduce them. Uh, that's, that is either the good thing if you were owning the genetics or the downfall of hybrid uh, is, is it, it, it ends with that particular breed. It, I mean, with that particular hybrid cross. So it was a way of controlling the seed stock. It was a way of controlling and having all the power and the parents of these birds were kept. Um, and of course, as it grew, it became more and more complicated and they moved completely away from anything recognizable as standard bread because now they began to cross F1 crosses and, and further that and moving away from any type of purebred or standard bred poultry. Right. So now I think the next, so what we can see is the industry here started to switch in a new direction, which was the, the, the hybrids. And that was even, you know, even with, as the industry was growing, they were still with the standard bread, but you know, and this, this ushered in a new direction. And so the next thing I wanna talk about <clears throat> is the introduction of the obese strain chickens. And um, and these are the chick. These are the these are the these are the birds that really led to the creation of the modern day Cornish cross. And so, Frank, can you talk about the obese strain chickens, the original experiments, and how they were found and, and then developed into what we have today. Well, this particular photograph that you're showing here, this was done back in the early '50s or late '50s, I mean, 1950s, um, where they had a flock of Leghorns at. Cornell University, and amongst these showed up a few females out of these legrins who were quite different than their parents. Uh, this particular mutation caused the chicken to be very short-legged and uh, had shorter wings and to seem to apparently grow faster and had silky feathers and had all kinds of what I would consider deformities. But the scientists were very curious about what had happened. Uh, I don't want to, I mean, we could go on about it, but I mean, basically this was the first recognition of the obese mutation. Um, this 
particular mutation was then bred to some other st uh, more standard bred poultry in which they had different levels of this mutation introduced. And they noticed that they could pass this particular gene uh, mutation onto their offsprings. And it did have an effect in that bird's ability to grow faster, uh, put on a heavier breast. Uh, but then they began to select for various things. And within that obese strain, uh, came the mutation which became so important in the development of the, of the modern industrial broiler and that is dwarfism. So dwarfism is where you have a normal sized torso but you have four shortened legs, four shortened wings or limbs and a normal sized body. So this became the standard for then developed into the modern industrial broiler. If you notice in the photograph, there's a pure legger, and, and then on the far left is the is the pure obese gene, uh, and in the middle is the cross. So that shows you what happens when you cross these two things. And this began to do this. Um, the but this, cross, didn't happen, this didn't happen immediately, right? It was. Uh... Oh, the whole generation took this whole use of the obese gene and understanding the obese gene uh, took many decades. Um, in fact, it wasn't until in the late 60s that Dr. Paul Siegel from North Carolina State, who was uh, asked by Don Tyson to improve feed conversion and rate of growth in broilers, that Dr. Paul Siegel, who had read the papers and knew about the obese strain and its effect in the dwarfism, reached out and he began to spend the next 10, 15 years uh, developing, which then would eventually become more and more of the, what we call the modern broiler of today. Um, so the obese strain line had an, ex a tremendous effect as they began to move away from standard bred poultry into producing this animal that we have that we have today. This would never happen in nature because it's just not normal for a for an animal to do this. But they selected these various mutations. Great. And so today we want to the next slide. The you know, over time, they developed, they developed the modern industrial hybrid, which is an F14 or more uh, cross hybrid. Um, and can you explain what that looks like today in terms of the breeding sequences that are used to create the Cornish cross that a farmer might be buying from the hatchery or, or a consumer might be buying in the store? Yeah, the chicken at the very bottom, the one that you buy at the store, that they call a Cornish rock, which really probably has hardly any Cornish R rock in it, but they held on to the original name from back in the 50s, um, grows to six and a half pounds in 42 days. Um, that's a result of the parents that you see in the next stage up, which would be the parent stock, which carry the genetic genes that they have selected to be able to produce a broiler that will grow in 42 days. Above that is the grandparent stock. Now, once you get above the parent stock and you get into the grandparent stock, then you're talking about multiple known mutations that the industry knows about that will result in the levels down below. And grandparent stock, and then up above that's great grandparent stock. Um, those birds are never allowed outside of the industry. Those are all kept within the industry. They have spent millions of dollars developing those particular lines to end up with that follow that bird at the end. Um, and the various mutations can be anywhere from egg production to livability to uh, leg health to rate of growth to feed conversion. 
um, and you have hen lines, male lines. The other thing is, is by the time you get down to the parent stock, those are often brother and sister. We do know that within the hybrid industry today, um, if you were to compare that chicken with the red jungle fowl, the bird we started with, there is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the genetic diversity is now no longer there. This is a total monoculture. Um, they're all closely, closely related. And this is how you're able to produce uh, a chicken that by the billions that all look like the identical one right before it. And, um, uh, and, and they've, you know, they've, they've mapped, they mapped the genome of all these birds and they're, and they're, um, and they're, and they've mapped out the different mutations and, cr and cross them in a way that they get the resile, the desired result that they want. They, they, they have this, it's a very finely tuned process of genetic engineering. It's not genetic modification, but it's engineering those genetics to go in just the right way that you're getting, you're getting that 42 day bird at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, the, the genome, the complete genome mapping was done a number of years ago by the, the new power source within the poultry industry, and that's the Chinese government, uh, working with Dr. Paul Siegel from North Carolina State and with Uppsala University out of Sweden. Um, they were able to isolate. They were able to isolate the obese gene. They were able to isolate the dwarf gene. And they now know what percentage of that particular gene mutation is in every level throughout the whole hybrid line there, uh, whether that chicken is carrying um, a mutation uh, of the obese gene or the, or the dwarf gene that may be a fourth percent or an eighth percent, but they know if they cross, you know, it gets very complicated. In fact, if you want to raise chickens and breed chickens today for the industry, uh, you better get your PhD in genetics. Um, because they have now, they, the, the great grandparent stock, uh, they now actually put chips in them so that when they go into, uh, of course now all these, when you get to that high level, those birds are kept in cages at some um, farm, they really aren't farms, they're industrial complexes uh, in Europe. Right, and so, I, you know, what, what we're saying is they created this hybrid, it takes, 14 lines of birds that are crossed together in order to get what you have or more. Because sometimes above the great, great grandparent stock, they keep also, uh, they keep another level that maintain higher levels of certain mutations. And <clears throat> they all have to be mixed together in the right way. And they are able to get a bird that grows fast or lays a lot of eggs, and they're able to keep control of those genetics. And, and the thing to, to understand is when you're talking about a freedom ranger, or slower growing hybrids, which has become very popular in the, um, sorry, I just went forward one, but that's okay. Um, that, that are very popular in the regenerative movement. Those are variations of that Cornish cross. They're mixing in another line, uh, you know, another line which has slower growth or something of that sort in order to slow down that growth, uh, you know, with the red feather pattern and, and all that stuff. So <clears throat> these are all controlled by Cobb and, and Ross or maybe a Gen, and, and they all come from those systems. Um, so, um, so I think next we just want to look at the hybrid versus a standard bread and what they've been able to create and, and the differences in growth. And then I'm going to just talk about this and the differences in production. And then Frank, I'm going to have you afterwards talk about the differences in the welfare, the health of the animal, and the uh, and the quality of the meat, and the health of the meat. So you can we can really see the the what this what are the the consequences of these changes. But if you're just looking at rate of growth, it, it takes the industrial um, leghorn about six to eight weeks, or it takes a standard red bird about fifteen to eighteen weeks to grow to. And so you're able to run about twice as many runs a year when you're raising the industrial hybrid. Industrial hybrid also has a feed conversion rate of about two to two and a half pounds of feed per pound of live weight. And the, and the standard bred birds, 
um, the, the, the ones that are grown for more of the meat production specializing birds, they'll take about three and a half to four pounds of feed per pound of live weight. And then another big difference is that the birds require a lot more space. Um, they're very active birds. Um, even when you're, when you're comparing the industrial uh, uh, um, egg layers to, the indust to, to standard bread, the standard bread are much more active. And so they need a lot of space and they need, they need a lot of things to do. And so if you have a Cornish cross, they're not gonna really move much. A lot of people raising Cornish cross in tractor systems will give them a foot or a foot and a half each because they're okay, they don't move that much. You mostly just sit there and eat. They, they'll, they'll pick around and move around a bit, and, but, but they don't need that much. And if you give that much space to standard bread birds, they just gonna suffer greatly. They just can't live in that kind of environment because they're real true birds and they need the space. And when you get to the, to the egg layers, the, the standard bread egg layers lay less per year. They take longer to start laying, but they do keep laying throughout their lives. Whereas the industrial egg layers, they burn out very quickly. And similarly, you can see with the with turkeys, standard bread birds take about twice as long to raise. They have a much higher feed conversion, similar to the chickens. They need a lot more space, but they can run, they can fly, they can breed naturally. Um, whereas the turkeys, industrial turkeys can't breed naturally. And you see also a very big difference in the parent stock and the grandparent stock and great grandparent stock within the, within the hybrids that those hybrids, because they have to be maintained living past when they're done growing, basically the birds eat, they're eating constantly and they actually have, they, they, they can't regulate their appetite properly. That's one of the things that's been brought out of them. That's okay when they're young and they just keep eating and then, and then, they're, and then they're using that for growth. But once they finish growing, they, they want to keep eating. But if you let them just keep eating as much as, as they're hungry, as much as they want, they will actually just eat themselves to death. And so they have to be put on what we call starvation diets or severe feed restrictions in order to keep them alive. And, and with the turkeys, they have to be artificially inseminated. So every turkey, hybrid turkey in the United States is all a product of artificial insemination. And, um, and many of them are raised in total confinement. Generally, they're raised very, very confined in very controlled environment. And, uh, and also a lot of the chickens are artificially inseminated because this affects their... Um, this affects their fertility greatly. <clears throat> so we can see there's a huge difference here in production. And this does cause standard bread poultry to be much more expensive to produce. Um, so Frank, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, the different, you know, those differences, we can see those humongous differences in, in the way the birds um, live and, and, and in their productivity, how that affects the birds, their health, their welfare their their and uh and the quality and and healthiness of their of their meat i want to speak just a second on something that you just said about the high standard bread poultry being far more expensive um i always like to say that with standard bread poultry they can be unbelievably cheap to raise if you let the bird do all their work, which they're still capable of doing. They're still capable of breeding on their own, finding their own food, hatching their own offspring, raising them up. And you can literally put a chicken on your table uh, with absolutely no money. If you allow, which Santa bread poultry is still capable of doing that. Uh, if you dress the birds yourself and so on, which all of that would be completely impossible with the hybrid industrial bird. Uh, you couldn't do any of that. Um, in comparison, you know, the standard bread poultry is excellent immunity and health. Uh, it has a balanced skeletal structure. Um, it's high welfare outcome. I mean, they will survive and withstand multiple different types of climates and they can be outside when it's a hundred degrees or if there's snow on the ground, you know, because they have not, they, they're not forced through all of the other problems that you find amongst hybrid broilers. Um, they have weak immune systems, they have poor health. The hyperthyroidism, which we talk about, uh, actually, the young chicken in, in the egg stage actually has hyperthyroidism, and that 
the, the thyroxin is produced within that chicken that causes that rapid growth for about the first three to four weeks. And that's when the, the chicken just explodes in size because it's, it's through that particular mutation uh, is produced in these high levels of thyroxin. And then all of a sudden the thyroid just collapses and starts producing no thyroxin and becomes hyperthyroid. And then the, the young, all the industrial broilers then become diabetics, which causes them to become morbidly obese. So the whole system is really rather sad. Um, also because of their dwarfism, because of the short little limbs and, and short little stubby legs, um, they have all kinds of skeletal structures. Uh, because of the dwarfism, the hip bone is actually displaced farther in the back. And so 90% of all broiler chickens that are brought in for processing have some type of uh, skeletal fractures, whether they to be hairline. But we know through various studies, especially a lot of those studies done in England, that the modern industrial chicken is often in pain. Uh, the modern in, uh, industrial broiler has to waddle when it walks because it just can't support uh, its own body weight. It's equivalent to a, uh, an 11 year old child weighing four or 500 pounds. Um, the higher levels of fat that the chicken acquires once it becomes a diabetic, um, and it has low, high levels of omega-6 in ratios to its omega-3s. It's much higher in cholesterol. Um, and they literally cannot reproduce themselves without some type of artificial intervention. With turkeys, it's completely 100% gone because they've done the same thing to turkeys they've done to broilers, but they push turkeys to the point where they just physically cannot naturally mate anymore. 25% uh, of all broiler chickens ra being raised today worldwide, now 20, they're up to 25% of artificially inseminating even chickens. Um, egg layers, that's another whole thing. If we're going to get into uh, hybridized egg layers, they have literally shrunk them down to little bitty hens that are about a three fourths smaller than their ancestors. Uh, they're they're being asked to lay, you know, three hundred eggs or more a year, so they literally deplete all the calcium. There was a recent study just came out in the last month. Again, showing that probably somewhere between 65-70% of all layer hens uh, have skeletal fractures, uh, especially in the keel bone. So, and this has nothing to do with free-ranged, all-natural pasture or anything. This is all genetics. Um, and so, and and how would you just can you just talk about also how it affects the the flavor and uh, texture of the meat um, of, uh, of an industrial layer versus a, industrial uh, broiler versus, uh, versus a standard bread chicken? This is really a hard one because we now have 50 years of people eating this, eating baby birds. We now have 50 years of people going to the grocery store and if they buy chicken breast, they expect for it to cook in three minutes because it's basically just fat and water. Uh, and also since it's a baby bird with that you know, physical activity, it, it, to me, it's just like gray matter. It's just basically mush. Um, but now people think that's normal. So if they eat a standard bread bird for the first time, all of a sudden they have to chew they now have muscle that has been active, that has lived longer, that is much darker, much higher in textural structure. And so to break it down, the cooking is quite different and so on. But for some people, it's quite a shock. And so some people say, well, I'm not eating that. It's tough or it's chewy or whatever. And that has multiple reasons. Uh, but the whole textural thing can be quite quite a change until people get used to what normal chicken meat should taste like. 
We also approved uh, at K-State uh, that our, the, our chickens, because they live long enough, the omega-3 is much higher in a standard bred bird. In fact, to get the same amount of the good cholesterol, you would have to eat six industrial chickens. So, but that's the results of longevity. Uh, to be able to convert omega-6 to omega-3 in development, the animal has to live long enough for that fat chain to happen. And the other thing is there has to be oxygenation of the muscle. And this is a real problem in the industrial chicken because they're so morbidly obese, they find it almost impossible to oxygenate the muscle. The, their little, the internal organs on these 42-day-old 40 birds that weigh 300 times more than they should, the internal organs are still the same size. So you have a five-week-old chicken trying to, in that tiny little heart and lungs, trying to get oxygen, oxygen to the muscle in this huge, humongous body. So uh, the muscle just doesn't change. And the omega-3s never, <laughs> just don't happen. Right. Thanks, Frank. So, and I think a, a big piece of the difference also is that you have just so much more diversity. People are used to eating now a fat baby chicken that barely moves. And with, uh, with standard bread, you can have a very young chicken that's more tender and you can have anything up to a, a, an old egg layer that's, that's a few years old and is fat and delicious and and they all have to be cooked differently, but the, the flavor develops as it gets older. So you can have a six month or an eighth month old chicken that has much more flavor. You can have a 16 week old chicken that has more flavor than, than the Cornish cross, but is, but, you know, but is not quite as much flavor as that one. And, and they require different cooking times and, and methods, but you have so much more. But once you learn that, those, the different ways to cook them, you have so much more diversity. And if you do cook them properly, they're still very tender. They just, it's just different, just not a mush, but the, the flavor um, variety and then the variety of the different breeds is, is just much, much greater, but that's not what people are used to today. Um, so um, with that, I just wanna, I want to talk a little bit about the Good Shepherd Conservancy. I hope people could hear from that, what, you know, the importance of standard bread and the difference of that bird and, and the health difference. And I think the one thing that we didn't mention is the, some of also the consequences this could have on human health, um, both from eating an unhealthy bird, but also um, the diseases um, that seem to be um, proliferating in those flocks. So the high pathogenic bird flus, which are very dangerous to people if they get into human populations, they seem to proliferate in the industrial breeders, um, industrial broiler breeders, because they have such a difficult time in life and such difficult immune systems. When, when you've had the flus go into those flocks, um, they tend, they, that's where you see the emergence generally, most often of those highly pathogenic bird flus. And, uh, and also so many of these birds are getting antibiotics, even if they're keeping the, now they're starting to keep the antibiotics out of the out of the out of the broilers that you're eating um, up in that chain, they're still using a lot of antibiotics and they're still using them in the broilers as well. And that's creating that antibiotic resistant bacteria. So there's a lot of health consequences for the birds and for the healthiness of the meat, but also the, there's some long-term concerns about health consequences for human populations from the creation of these birds. Something I wanted to mention. Um, do you have anything else to say about that, Frank, about those high pathogenic part of it antibiotics? Is, is that people like to know they're buying chicken meat, hybrid chicken meat that is antibiotic free. And that doesn't mean they didn't use any of the sulfas, any drugs that are labeled non-antibiotic. But the other thing is, is that short period of time that, that those chickens live and that they don't feed them antibiotics, that's fine, whatever. But the real problem is not the chickens that you buy, it's the parent stock, the great grandparent stock that are kept their entire time 
on levels of subtherapeutic levels of antibiotics. Now you have a, a, an animal that lives long enough for the mutations uh, of extreme viruses, especially bacteria, to take place. Um, most of the bacterial diseases that have caused um, issues have not come really from uh, the chickens that you buy for eating, but from the parent stock. Um, the, the workers in the hatcheries, the workers, you know, and that's the real problem, but they've got to keep those birds on antibiotics or they just won't live long enough to produce the eggs. Um, so the real concern for this isn't so much to me in, in the food, that, but that doesn't mean they aren't using antibiotics. Right. Okay, thanks, Frank. So I'm just gonna do this quick. I wanna talk about the Good Shepherd Conservancy, the Good Shepherd Poultry Ranch, um, and then we can go and, and, and open it up for questions afterwards. So um, just to first just bring up Good Shepherd uh, uh, Poultry Ranch, Frank started uh, over 20 years ago uh, when he moved, uh, he moved back from Texas to his, to his, uh, to his, to Kansas, um, to his hometown. You grew up in Lindsberg, right, Frank? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He moved back to his hometown and started to raise standard bread poultry and devote his life to conserving the standard bread breeds. And uh, during that time, he was uh, mostly focusing on exhibition of poultry, uh, like the APA mostly does today, uh, poultry exhibition, poultry shows. And, uh, and while that was happening, Marion Burroughs, New York Times writer, you can see in the picture there with Frank, she, she wanted to find the best tasting turkey in the United States. And she was looking around and, uh, and was referred to Frank by people from the Livestock Conservancy. And she got turkeys from all over the country. And, and Frank, she said Frank's was the best. But Frank won the competition being the best tasting turkey in America. And, and, and when that happened, that um, uh, Slow Foods caught wind of this. And uh, one of the heads of Slow Foods, Patrick Martins, uh, uh, called Frank and, and, and asked him to, uh, if he wanted to produce heritage poultry, a heritage turkey for the um, standard bread heritage turkey for Thanksgiving that year uh, and the next year. And Frank uh, teamed up with Patrick and they produced 500 heritage turkeys uh, for that Thanksgiving. And the business grew from there. And Frank started to see that maybe the best way to save these birds was by reintroducing them to the food market where they really were not available at all before this started 20 years ago. And, uh, and, and Frank grew turkey market and chicken market from, from his farm. Um, and so Frank's been doing that for 20 years. And, and what he's found is that there's really, really um, difficult production challenges and marketing challenges with standard bread poultry. And I want to talk about those. And these are really the, and just talk about those quickly. And these are the, the things that we're really trying to address um, to help us grow the standard bread industry in the United States. So one of the biggest ones is lack of availability of genetics. Um, there's not a lot of standard bread poultry out there. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, selling heritage, but mostly it's coming from the big mail order hatcheries that aren't really maintaining quality control and standards, and and they're not really maintaining those those um, st the standard the standards of the American Poultry Association. And you could be getting a lot of different things mixed into that. You could be getting um, just birds that have just degraded over time, and you're not really getting that quality and consistency that standard bread offered. Um, you know, when it was when it was the when it made up the industry. And so when people are going, trying to get the genetics, having a very hard time. And a lot of people come to Frank and he's just not able to serve everybody. So there's a huge lack of ability, availability of genetics. And then there's the high production cost to produce this commercially. And that translates to high product cost. The people are used to chickens that are artificially cheap because of everything they've done. A chicken used to be a, a, a gourmet meat that was eaten rarely. And it's become the everyday thing, the cheap everyday meat through this. And, and for people to start buying standard bread um, is a big deal because it costs a lot more. And then um, there's a lack of infrastructure to also support that production. And, um, and then there's a lack of consumer awareness. The people don't understand why it's important. What is all these benefits that, you, that we've shown you that standard bread brings 
um, they just don't really understand that. And so they say, well, why this is a pasture raised bird, this is a pasture raised why should I pay all this extra money uh, for a pedigreed bird? And so there's a huge lack of consumer awareness of the health issues of what, what an industrial hybrid truly is and what makes it grow that fast and, and all the consequences of that and all the benefits that you have with a standard red bird. And then there's a lack of cooking knowledge that people don't know how to cook the birds and they might take it and cook it like a Cornish cross and they say, this is tough, this is gross. Whereas if they'd cooked it properly, it's the most delicious chicken you've eaten. And, and, um, and then there's a lack of production experiences within the growers and especially within breeders. The Frank is really the only breeder in the United States that's, that's raising this in any kind of volume for food production. Most of the breeders that are raising standard poultry are, are growing for poultry shows today. And they've really forgotten the production piece and how important it is that these birds produce well. And so, um, so, you and, and so if, you know, with Frank would go much knowledge of how to breed these birds for market production. And so there's a huge risk here that we could lose so much knowledge in the next 10 or 20 years if we don't pass on that knowledge to other people. And also just with the growers, that the growers understand the differences and, 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 and the unique things and how you have to grow these birds and especially within the modern industry, how, how to do that. And then the last thing is misinformation, mislabeling. There's um, so many people out there now putting heritage on their birds and they're raising freedom rangers or they're raising even Cornish crosses in the same heritage because it's not a protected term. And, and, and they're saying heirloom, you know, and it's just, uh, it might just be an industrial turkey, broad-breasted turkey, but it's broad-breasted bronze where it maintains the, something similar to the old feather pattern, to the feather patterns of bronze, but it's nothing like a bronze. So we see that there's these huge difficulties in raising these birds and marking them properly. And Frank's been able to find a path within that, but it's a very hard thing. And there are a lot more people now that want to produce heritage poultry, but they don't really know how to navigate that. So we founded the Good Shepherd Conservancy in 2020. And, and our goal is to preserve standard bread through food production. Um, the Livestock Conservancy is focused on heritage breeds, generally all different types and different species and, and whatnot. And the APA is focused on standard bread, but mostly through, they're mostly really focused on the on shows today, even though there's a contingent within the APA that really wants to focus more on production. And so we brought forward the Good Shepherd Conservancy to really focus on saving, preserving standard bread poultry through food production. That's our goal. And we're working on passing on the torch to a new generation of farmers and breeders. And we're also working on educating the general public so that they can understand what I hope you've, you've all come to understand through this presentation, the, all the benefits the standard bread bird brings, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's the health and quality of the meat um, and whether, whether it's the welfare outcomes for the chickens to live a much better lives. So teaching people about the benefits of standard bread and the truth about the industrial hybrids and what they are and the diseases they carry, the hypothyroidism, dwarfism, um, irritable bowel syndrome, all the things that they suffer from and, that, and, and all the consequences that has on the quality of the meat and the health of the meat, as well as all the culinary techniques for standard bread. That's also a long term goal is to help make, make that more accessible to people understand how to cook these birds. And we're focused on preserving America's most important production breeds. And we've identified 10 breeds, 10 APA certified standard red birds that we're gonna be focusing on um, for now. And, and our first focus is to get these birds. These are, we've chosen with turkeys, the bourbon red, which is a very tasty bird. It does better in hot climates and in the South, and it won the first, it won the Marion Burroughs competition for best tasting turkey. The standard bronze is, 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 the, is, the, is, the, is the father of all the turkeys today. They all came from the standard bronze. And saving that is really saving the, 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 saving the foundation of all standard red turkeys today. The Narragansett, another one of the great old uh, breeds of turkey. And then the White Holland, an important production breed. And we wanted to also include a white feathered bird um, within our preservation program always, um, at least one white feathered bird because today's market people are used to white feathers. We think that's important to competing in today's market. And then within chickens, for the egg laying, we are focusing on the leghorn and the menorca. Uh, the leghorn is a prolific egg layer and very, very endangered. The true leghorn, standard red leghorns are very endangered. And the menorca is 
is a very prolific egg layer, lays big white eggs, and is also a big bodied bird that's a good dual production bird that also has very prolific egg laying. And then within the meat, the meat dual purpose meat birds, we've, we're focusing on, on the Plymouth Rock, which we talked about how important that is for American um, broiler production and, and all the qualities of that bird. The New Hampshire, which took over as a top broiler in the United States from the Plymouth Rock for a time, before the hybrid, for a short time before the hybrid came in, it's a faster growing bird, not that fast growing, but a little faster than the Plymouth Rock. And, um, and it's a very hardy quality bird. And then we're focusing on the Rhode Island white, which never really gained widespread popularity. But what we found is that it has the white feathers and it also is a very good dual production bird, has good egg laying and also has very big bodied and produces a really quality carcass. And then we also preserving the Cornish, which was a very important bird for producing a lot of the other standard red birds that are out there today, but it's also a great bird for crossing, for creating those F1 crosses, the Cornish New Hampshire, the Cornish Plymouth Rock um, uh, hybrids that gained so much popularity that farmers should be able to produce those F1 crosses, which would be considered heritage birds and not standard birds, but they're coming from two standard bred parents. We think that's also gonna be important with competing in the modern market. So we've chosen 10 birds that are really capable, we feel, of competing today. And we wanna get the population of each of these birds up to 10,000 plus certified standard bred birds. Um, you know, people will claim there's lots of Plymouth Rocks in the country, but most of them are not real standard bred and they're not producing the quality or really meeting those standards. And we want those to be over hundred farms, so 10, 10 farms each to really stabilize the population of these birds. And, um, and then we can go from there to grow them even more into the millions and, and add other breeds into the preservation program. That's our goal of our preservation program. That's our initial goal right now. Um, and we're doing this through two central programs. One of them is a Good Shepherd Conservancy Center. So we're working on building an educational center in Lindsburg, Kansas on Frank's farm that will have a, um, will have a working hatchery. It will have a big, large barn that will house these 10 breeds plus others, and people can come and work and train and learn in this place. It will also have a um, museum, a living museum where people will be able to go in and see all the different standard bred birds and then learn about this history, everything that we've taught you today in an interactive immersive setting. They're gonna really learn about this. We can bring in media and there's gonna be a library and archive that, that saves uh, important historical documents about poultry and people can go and read and learn about these things in an in-depth way. We wanna have a professional kitchen and a guest house that princes will come and be able to apprentice on the farm and learn how to produce these birds, learn how to breed them and, and also be able to have in youth education, have in 4-H future farmers, to really understand about America's history within poultry and what happened to it and what's happening with the modern industrial system. And, um, and, and then also even have professional studies and research done on standard bread poultry and hybrid poultry within the center. We, we're, gonna, we, we're envisioning this as an agritourism destination, a stone barns of the Midwest um, that's really focusing on poultry and poultry production. And um, this will be kind of a center and a bulwark against the industrial takeover of, of uh, poultry in America. And the one thing to mention is we have people from all over the world actually contacting us now because they're moving the industrial hybrids into Africa, into, into Asia, and they're trying to take over the world and displace all the indigenous breeds of poultry throughout the world, indigenous varieties, and really replace them with this hybrid system. And so we're working on fighting back in the United States and just preserving what we have. And we're hoping to also help uh, worldwide eventually to, to help preserve indigenous breeds of poultry and, and, and the traditional methods of raising poultry and not let this industrial takeover that's almost completely wiped out the entire industry in the United States also wipe out uh, the industry, the, you know, the old industry worldwide. And so the other piece that we're doing is the farm fellowship where we're training the next generation of farmers in standard poultry production and breeding. We are going to be um, providing the farmers with the genetics, with these top tier genetics um, from Frank Reese. And, and, and then we will also be working at the conservancy to improve those genetics and help those and help provide those farmers with continually improving genetics while at the same time 
working with some of the farmers to provide them long-term master breeder training where they can learn to be master breeders like Frank Reese and carry on that tradition past him. Um, we wanna have an annual conference and have the farmers and have the general public come and learn about breeding, learn about poultry and learn about this really, um, really fascinating world of, of poultry and poultry breeding and also allow those farmers to create a network where they can cooperate with each other and help each other and purchase from each other. And we're really trying to spread this out throughout the country. And we'll also be advertising our farmers and, um, and uh, through our network and our social media and email. And uh, we've had over 60 farms apply and we're hoping to start this next year. And, um, and we would encourage other farmers that are interested in standard bread production to really join this program and, and find out more about it. And uh, that can be found out on our website, thegoodshepherdconsumacy.org. And also all other information can be found on our website about what we're doing uh, within, within this world, thegoodshepherdconsumacy.org. Um, and so that's it, that's the presentation. Frank, would you like to say uh, another word, anything else before we move on to Q&A? No, that's fine. <clears throat> we don't have much time left. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge. And, uh, and thanks to uh, everybody at Regenerate for hosting us. And, um, and uh, we're happy to open up for questions now. Um, I definitely saw one in the chat, I think, from Alex. Yeah. And it looks like he's asking um, if hatcheries label the product as APA certified standard bread. Is that trustworthy enough? Or do you have recommended hatcheries that are meeting these standards and breeding these birds that you are seeking to preserve? He is saying there are hatcheries that are selling certified standard bread poultry? If, if they do. I don't know of any hatchery that's doing that, but I would be very impressed because that would be based upon the parent stock of those chicks that they, that a licensed judge our judges have come to the, the to the parent stock. Uh, so if you could do that, that would be good. So so Frank, I can talk a little bit about this because I know a little bit of what's going on. There was one hatchery, um, fire, uh, fire fox, fire. Well, the one in Florida. Something fire hatchery, and they had one APA certified breed, the um, the the copper morans. Uh, yes that they that they were um they had certified and then now i just found out it was in the yearbook this year i'm not sure if you saw it frank in the apa yearbook um murray mcmurray is coming out next year with five i think apa certified standard bred birds so they are going to be coming out with a few and what i can say um and i think frank probably would agree with is that if those are APA certified, you, you should be able to trust that that's what you're getting is an APA certified bird, a real standard red bird. Um, the only question is, are they gonna be quality market production birds? And that we can't speak to. I know that Frank has been working to produce quality market production birds for you know, many years of his life, for, for decades. And that's produced high quality birds. Now, if you're a farm and then Murray, now most standard bred birds out there are not that. They've, people have been focusing on maybe keeping them to standards, but really focusing more on the feathers and not the market quality. And so I don't know what the market quality of those birds from Murray McMurray are gonna be, although chances are it's not gonna be the best market quality bird, just depending on what's out there. But you know, that, that's gonna depend, but it's just starting now that you're starting to see APA certified birds because there was only that one bird ever available. And then there's Frank's flock, uh, that one bird from Fire uh, Fire Mountain, whatever they are, uh, hatchery. And then now Mary McMurray's coming out with a few, but we just don't know the quality that's gonna bring. And uh, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes left here before we wrap up in uh, just less than 10 minutes. So if you, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you. Yeah, and, and Frank, you would say that that's right, what I said about the-, uh, the Yeah, standard. so some of it's going to depend. I think it's wonderful that McMurray, McMurray and the APA is working together to do this. Some of it would depend on what breeds or varieties that they're certifying. Um, you can eat anything, but some birds are gonna do better 
than others as far as truly being a, a reliable source. If you're just raising some for your family use, I mean, there's people out there uh, eating all kinds of stuff and that's fine, all chickens are edible, but some are gonna be better for the general public and the market and, than others. Um, but also it's learning to the economics of the whole thing and, and at what level are you, you know, you plan on using these birds? Um, I, I don't remember so well all the breeds that they had. I remember they had like Polish was one of them, which is not a market bird. That's like a, that's really a show bird, a pretty bird. And, and I remember that there was one variety of, of Plymouth Rock, like silver or something or other above. Silver remember. pencil Plymouth Rock? I think it was silver pencil Plymouth Rock that they're going to have available. So maybe that might be a good production bird, you know, it's possible. But, uh, you know, I remember that most of them didn't seem like real production birds from, from what I remember. I don't remember all the varieties that they had in there. Well, the main thing is they are putting the word out that there is value in being an APA certification. So I'm pleased that the, there's, that they're, one of the hatcheries is attempting to do this a little bit. And they would, any knowledge we can get out there uh, about the APA certification, flock certification, to me is important. There's plenty of room for growth and work for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody else has any other questions about standard bread or the, um, you know, or the, the modern crosses, Cornish cross, the industrial hybrid, the industrial leghorn, the, um, the Freedom Ranger, uh, anything within that, anything within the presentation that we present, we're happy to uh, take questions. All right, so if we don't have any more questions in, I guess that's it. Um, I know we'd all like to thank you sincerely for being here, Frank and Jay. Um, excellent presentation, very informative. I know we all learned a lot about um, standard bread poultry. Uh, Lynn or Carrie, do you have anything to add before we wrap it up here? I think we have one question here. Um, I assume Chick-fil-A is using industrial chickens. How about Chipotle? So Frank, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, <laughs> I actually had the founder of Chipotle at my farm. They're using industrial, industrial broilers. Um, they tried to use some of my chicken meat from my chickens and because my chickens can run, jump, and fly. The, the, the dark meat is so dark that some of the people were a little confused. Uh, you know, they're used to that, that light gray matter that they sell for dark meat. But anyway, um, <clears throat> at that time, um, they, they did some test markets at Chipotle and just economically, if they were gonna have to charge 50 cents more per, uh, for, per chicken, Burrito. I think it was a dollar. It was a dollar fifty. I think they had to charge more. So yeah. they're back to using it. They use industrial. Yeah, I mean, I think you can uh, basically everything is industrial. Can you still hear? Oh, Frank is talking. Sorry, dude. You're breaking up a little bit, Frank. So we weren't hearing. Yeah. What were you saying? Go ahead. Okay. Am I still breaking up? No, no, now I can hear you. Uh, breaking up again. Um, I could just say, um, since Frank's having some problem with the sound, that everything is industrial. Any, any fast food, any restaurant, except for a select few and usually not all their products are gonna be industrial genetics. Any store you go to, virtually any farmer that you farmers market, it, it they've they've really completely transformed the industry and taken over everything. And Frank is left, and then there's a few other small growers, and there's a few people doing heritage chicken now in the in the regenerative movement that have figured out the problems with these birds and that they don't do so well on pasture and that they're having these issues. But even most of them are still doing. Um, uh, you know, are, are still doing the Cornish crosses or the Freedom Rangers, but a few people, you know, but there are small, we have 60 farmers that have contacted us wanting to join our program. 
So there's definitely people out there, but it's very small and oftentimes they don't have access to the genetics or what they're getting might, you know, right now might not be so, um, you know, standard bread. Maybe it's a heritage thing from, you know, you don't, it's not really meeting those standards or the quality. You know, I, I work in the kosher market and I'm working on getting this in the kosher market. And there's one kosher producer that was using Frank's genetics and became too hard to get them from Kansas. And they started buying from Murray McMurray, uh, Plymouth Rock, uh, Bar Rocks. And I know that once they started buying those Bar Rocks and Murray McMurray, the chicken sucked. It was just horrible. It just wasn't good anymore. Um, so you do see people raising standard uh, like heritage birds here and there, but usually the quality just isn't there. But you can get Frank's birds from Heritage Foods USA. And, um, and if you go to the Good Shepherd Conservancy, and that's an online distributor and they'll ship anywhere in the country. And, um, and then if you go to goodshepherdconservancy.org and sign up for our mailing list, I'm gonna be sending out a list of the people that are selling Frank's turkeys this Thanksgiving, which includes Heritage Foods, as well as um, about a half a dozen local distributors that are selling locally. And we're gonna send a list of that out next week um, so if you're interested in, in a Thanksgiving turkey that's standard red heritage uh, that will be available, um, you, you can sign up to our mailing list and we'll be sending out a list of that shortly. All right, so I don't see any more questions. Oh, okay, we got another one. Is there a certain environment, um, climate or vegetation that standard red birds need to thrive where else where else besides Kansas and uh, I assume the different breeds thrive in different environments uh, they also said feel free to answer it after it ends if you just wanted to connect with her but I thought I'm sure everyone would be interested Frank you want to answer this question okay in my back is it working for, for me yeah to you're coming through clearly that's a huge that's a very important question Anytime people contact me wanting to raise Santa Bread poultry, I often ask them where they live because what can exist in Florida may not exist well in Minnesota, but will do quite well in Southern California or Arizona. There are particular breeds that do very well in different types of climates. In fact, that's how they evolved. The whole Wyandotte family was actually developed in the, in the upper northeast part of the United States. And those birds do very well in those cold climates. They have pea cones and small wattles that won't freeze off during the winter. They have, they're very, their feathers are loose and large uh, and keeping them warm during very cold climates. But let's say you're down in New Mexico or Arizona or something, and you want something that's still big enough that maybe you could butcher and fry, that will will do quite well in hot climates, whether humid or uh, dry. Then you want to go to something like the Menorca. Uh, the Menorca chicken does very well in those warmer climates, and they have very large combs, and and yet the roosters at maturity will weigh nine nine and a half pounds. So there are particular breeds that do better in certain types of environments than others. Um, it, you know, so it does make a difference what you get. Yeah, and, but I think the, one of the differences though is that we're used to, people are used to now raising hybrids and the hybrids and, and, and the survivability and livability of the standard bread is so much better that comparatively almost any standard bred bird is going to do better in these climates except for when you get to the really extreme super hot south or super cold north you know the majority of growers are going to have a much easier time with the standard bred chickens in 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 most climates than they're going to have uh with with the with the industrial birds although if you're really especially if you're getting to those really intense climates you really want to pay a lot of attention to what you're, what you're buying, what kind of breeds you're raising. I think it's a better understanding of what dual production means too. It's really difficult because the industry has done a tremendously good job of, of dividing egg chickens from meat chickens. Um, and the whole idea of producing a chicken that is capable of doing both meat and eggs um, is another whole thing that's hard for people 
to wrap their heads around sometimes today because we now have 50 years of separating those two industries. All right, very good. Thank you so much. And that's all the questions. I think that's safe to say at this point that that wraps up all the questions. Um, if not, we are running towards the end of the session, so we are going to have to get off here. Um, again, want to extend our gratitude for you guys being here today. Thank you so, so much for giving us such an interesting presentation and all that great information on standard red poultry. Uh, anything to add, Lynn or Carrie, before we get off of this session? No, every time I, every time I visit here, Frank, I learned something new. And if you ever have the opportunity to visit Good Shepherd, you should. It's just wonderful. And he's just, he's dedicated his life to this. And, and uh, thank you, Jay, again, for being part of this. But um, it's a part of our, our agriculture that we need to kind of drill down and learn more about. So we're grateful that you all joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.